very warm welcome to our parents, friends, and grandparents who are joining us today. We are so proud of our Class 6 students, and we are thrilled to celebrate their talents and voices in this cross-curricular medieval celebration. At the core of the Marymount mission is our commitment to empower each student to discover her own voice and to find confidence in that voice to challenge, shape, and change the world. Even in this very unique year, we are delighted that our Class 6 girls have been able to explore the richness of their medieval studies during their history, language arts, and visual arts classes. The students studied the medieval period in history and focused on three main treasured narratives in their language arts unit, including the Canterbury Tales, Robin Hood, and King Arthur. Today, they will present original monologues, speeches, and scenes based on their own creative interpretation of these stories. Some are set in the medieval times and some are adapted into present day. You will see the visual and performing arts program in action through their beautiful individualized coat of arms and strong public speaking and acting skills. The medieval celebration is the first of three inter interdisciplinary units during their years in the upper middle school. We are so proud of our girls. We are thrilled to give you a glimpse into the dynamic curricular work which fills our days at Marymount. Let the celebration begin. Hello and welcome to the Class 6 Medieval Festival. Since January, Class 6 has been traveling through the Middle Ages throughout both Asia and Europe in our history, English, and art classes. With the help of Ms. Winch, Dr. Collins, Mr. Betts, and Mr. Smith, we work to make our medieval academic studies come to life. In history and English class, our cohort worked to, in teams to write original scripts analyzing the Knights of the Round Table. Today, you will see some of our original scenes, monologues, adaptations, and analysis come to life on our very own Marymount stage. We are so proud to have written all the words you're about to hear. With Ms. McCormick, we considered symbols and images that are meaningful to our personal identity, and we each illustrated a personal coat of arms that will be shown throughout the, our video production. During these challenging days, we are grateful for the opportunity to perform, learn, and safely have fun with one another. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our never-before-seen medieval celebration. The story of Sir Percival of Wales might be fictional, but it takes place in what was a very real time. This story was set during the medieval times, and during this time period, certain things like chivalry were valued a lot. Before Percival went on his quest, his mother tried to teach him the rules of chivalry, which he really misinterprets. Chivalry was invented by the church to keep knights in line. When there wasn't a war, quest, or crusade, knights got very bored, and as a result, they started acting up and doing bad things like beating up peasants and disrespecting women. The knights were causing a lot of problems, so the church came up with chivalry. Chivalry was a code of laws the knights had to follow. They had to help the poor and defenseless, and they also had to respect and treat women with kindness. Knights could never back down once they had accepted a challenge. They fought till death, and they were never supposed to spare an opponent or allow themselves to be spared. If you broke the rules of chivalry, you would be excommunicated. Being excommunicated was very serious. It meant that you could not go to heaven. In this story, two characters, Sir Kay and Percival, don't exactly get along. During this time, people from Wales were thought of by the British to be a bunch of uncivilized people living in the wilderness, so Sir Kay did not think much of Percival because he was from Wales. In the eyes of Sir Kay, not only was this barbarian child being sent on a quest by the king himself, he had no training. Normally in medieval times, you had to go through three steps to become a knight. First, you were a page. As a page, you learned to dance and play instruments and behave in court. Then you were a squire. As a squire, you trained under a knight, you, learned, you cleaned the knight's armor, and followed them into battle. At last, you were knighted. This whole process took seven, started when you were seven and took many years. But Percival was 15 when he was sent on his quest and had done none of these things. Do you think Percival will be successful in becoming a knight? Well, you're about to find out.
welcome everyone to King Arthur's Court. I am pleased to have you here with me today. I am the Red Knight and I'm taking King Arthur's goblet. Whoever goes and kills this thief and brings back my goblet and his armor will be knighted and will sit with me at the round table. I, Percival of Wales, shall bring to you your goblet and the Red Knight's armor and take a seat with you at the famous round table. Preposterous, you cannot trust him, he's just a boy and from Wales, no less. I will go. Silence, Percival of Wales shall go and retrieve my goblet and the Red Knight's armor. You may borrow armor, a horse, and a weapon of your choice. I only need a horse. I have my dart as a weapon, and I will bring back the armor of the Red Knight. Then off you go, Percival of Wales, and God bless you on this quest. This is preposterous. He isn't even a knight. What are you thinking? You will never catch me. Ha ha! Yes, I will. Ha ha, oh. got you now. Hello there, young boy. Do you need some help? Uh, yes, please. I have tried and failed to take off this armor. Thank you, uh... Sir Gowan, and you're welcome. You know, if you wish to become a knight, you must be a good... You must have a good teacher. I used to be a knight once. Would you like some training? How did you know? I, Percival of Wales, have brought to you your goblet and the Red Knight's armor. How is this possible? How could the small foolish boy bring back your golden cup, the Red Knight's armor, and kill the Red Knight? Silence, Sir Kay. The young boy has done a great deal at completing the quest. And now I shall do what I have promised him and make this boy a knight of my round table. And he shall sit next to me and take Sir Kay's place. Thank you, King Arthur, and as for you, Sir Kay, you're a big meanie panini. Oh, and Sir Kay, you are no longer a knight of my round table. No! Time travel back to the medieval ages, shall we? The knights at the round table had sat at a time where knights are at large and the feudal social and political structure has not yet eroded away. At the top of the feudal social and political structure pyramid is a monarch, who in the story is King Arthur. Under the monarch is the lord, under the lord are the knights, and lastly, under the knights are the peasants. This structure makes it almost impossible to move classes, but in the story, Percival does, becoming a knight of a famous king. This most likely would not be possible because becoming a knight is expensive. Most peasants cannot afford this without knowing someone of importance in the castle. Percival has grown up not knowing anybody but his mother, so he wouldn't have these contacts. But who doesn't love a good underdog story? During this time, peasants lived on a manor, which are centered around, of course, the manor. The manor was used for protection, celebrations, and the king's court. The peasants usually lived around the manor because they worked there. In the story, Percival goes to Sir Gonman's manor and learns to be a knight. Going here helps him skip the page and squire step to knighthood. As mentioned before, the training for knighthood was achieved in two steps. The first step was being a page where they spent most of their time learning how to be a high member of society. They learned to sing, ride a horse, and they received a religious education all valuable parts of becoming a knight. The next step was being a squire, where they learned to fight with a the knight, they cleaned the knight's armor, dressed the knight in its armor, and even waited on the lord at dinner. The squires went into battle with their knight, and if they performed well enough, they could become a knight. Due to his quick path to becoming a knight, Percival does not formally learn chivalry. Instead, his mother briefly explains chivalry to him, he, and he misunderstands. Chivalry is an important part aspect of a knight's life. Due to the poor behavior of the knights when they were not fighting at war, the church came up with a set of rules called chivalry. Chivalry basically says that you must be respectful towards women, protect the poor, and be just and righteous. It highlights that you cannot back down from a challenge and you cannot be spared. As you keep watching, think about it. I can't believe today is the day you start your journey to becoming a knight. Remember your mother's warnings to always act with chivalry, to give aid to a dame or damsel whenever they need it, and above all, 
to only take a kiss from a maiden and nothing else unless it's an exchange of rings. Percival says goodbye to his mother and heads into the forest, but Percival's father never seems to let go. As you can see, he decides to watch Percival from afar. What is this I see? A damsel sleeping in the middle of the forest? This is perfect! You know what to do, Percival. Your mother has prepared you for this. Okay, good. You're approaching her. And then... What are you doing, foolish boy? You do not kiss a random maiden in the middle of the forest. Everyone knows that. And what are you doing now? Taking her ring? What is going on? T giving her your ring? Percival, you have misunderstood your mother's message. You only exchange rings with a maiden if you're going to marry her. You don't marry the first person you see. This is going to be harder than I thought. The next day. Hey, I recognize that castle. That's King Arthur's castle. Go in, Percival. Go in. Wow, that red knight has the nerve to steal King Arthur's cup. Yikes. That was King Arthur's favorite cup. But I have faith in you, son, to find the red knight and bring back the chalice. Percival makes it to King Arthur's castle and witnesses the red knight stealing King Arthur's cup. King Arthur is very upset by this and tells Percival that if he can bring it back, then he will become a knight of the round table. Oh, Sir Kay, why are you being so difficult? Percival was chosen to bring back the chalice, not you, so get over it. You tell him, son, he better watch out for when you come back. As you can imagine, some, <clears throat> Sir Kay, were jealous of Percival and wanted to go find the Red Knight themselves. The next day. Okay, Percival, this is your shining moment. This is your chance to prove yourself worthy as a Knight of the Round Table. Look! There's the right knight. Get him, boy. Oh, dear. That is quite some aim you've got there. Quickly now, go and bring the armor and stolen cup back to the king. Who is this strange man walking toward you? Sir Gonmans? You could really use his help, son. You should take him up on the offer to train you to become a knight. A couple months later, Percival learned from Sir Gormans how to become a knight. After the training is over, Percival goes looking for the damsel he found in the forest, and he stumbles upon her castle. Okay, Percival, this is the second time you are going to be meeting this beautiful damsel. That must be a sign, right? So please, don't mess it up this time. The damsel's name was Blanchefleur. Percival and Blanchefleur experience an extraordinary vision together. Blanchefleur interprets the vision as Percival assisting on the Holy Grail quest, but he will not be the one who completes it. In order to assist in the Grail Quest, Percival must be patient and wait till the time has come. I can't believe it! The Holy Grail Quest? What an honor! Son, you need to be sure you listen to Blanche Fleur's warnings and wait till it's your time. To much of our surprise, Percival totally discards Blanche Fleur's warnings to wait and leaves immediately in search of the Grail. This was a big mistake and Percival realizes he should have waited. He goes back to try to find the beautiful Blanche Fleur, but he can't find her and he gives up his search and finally goes back to Camelot to return the cup to King Arthur. Percival ends up being dubbed as the Knight of the Round Table and assists on the Grail Quest many years later. After the Grail is found, as if it was some type of miracle, Percival finally finds Blanche Fur. Finally! I knew you could do it, son! I never doubted you for a moment! Last night, I woke up abruptly to the sound of my castle door opening. I was sleeping on my cell couch, but I didn't get up because I was scared it was an intruder. As I lay there, I heard footsteps coming near me. It was a tall man. He looked around my age. I was pretending to be asleep. He looked at me for a moment, then all of a sudden, I knew he wasn't there to harm me. He was there of coincidence. Then he looked at my hand. He noticed my ruby red ring. He had a beautiful ring with a white diamond. He switched out our rings, so now he wore my ruby red ring and I wore his white diamond ring. After he switched the rings, he kissed me. Soon after, he started walking towards the door. At that moment, I just wanted to tell him that I was awake and wanted him to stay, but I did not. I didn't because something in my mind told me that I was him again. He walked out the door and got on his horse. Once I heard the horse scalps, I ran out the door from, to see him from a distance. By the time I got to the road, I couldn't see him at all. All I could hear, all I could do was hear the horse ride farther and farther away from me. As I walked back to my castle, I had so many thoughts in my head. Who was he? Where did he come from? Why did he give me his ring? Why did he kiss me? Why did he switch out our rings? I felt like I would never get closure. Then 
I remember that feeling, the warm, safe feeling, the feeling that made me feel like I would never be in pain again. I looked at the ring that he gave me and a final thought came to my head. Did he give me this as a wedding ring? Did he give me this as a sign that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with me? I did not know the answer to those questions. All I knew was that I was going to see him again, and I did over and over in my dreams. One beautiful day, I remember taking a quick little nap to give my body a rest from the hardworking day. When I fell asleep, my ruby ring was still on my fourth finger. I felt some movement while I was deep in my sleep, but I thought about I was dreaming about some knight and coming and giving me a kiss. Could you imagine? Then, when I woke up from my sleep, I found that my ring was not ruby anymore. It was a single diamond ring. I looked around and only saw a knightly looking boy who was in the skins of animals. Turns out that boy was Percival, but I didn't find that out until later. Just as he was riding away, I saw his finger. Percival had swapped our rings, but just like that, he was gone. I don't think so. I decided to chase him, and I followed him all the way to King Arthur's castle. We met up outside King Arthur's castle, but before we even went in, me and Percival had a vision that me and another beautiful knight were in a different castle. I liked the sound of that. But in this vision, Percival was not there. He was on the Holy Grail quest. Percival, the ambitious boy that he is, took this to mean he should leave for the Holy Grail quest right that minute. Silly Percival didn't wait around long enough for me to tell him that in my vision, I saw something that he didn't. Oh well, let's see if he realizes that he's missing some crucial information. Have you ever heard of the Knights of the Round Table? Well, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is about a knight from King Arthur's Round Table accepting the challenge from the Green Knight. The Green Knight challenges Sir Gawain to strike him with his axe, and in a year and a day, the Green Knight will return the strike with equal force. When Sir Gawain accepted the challenge, he chopped the knight's head off, thinking that if he chopped his head off, he would die and he wouldn't have to come back. After Sir Gawain chopped the Green Knight's head off, the Green Knight stood up, picked up his head, and got on his horse and said, See to it that you keep your oath and seek me out in a uh, year hence. You will not fail to find me there if you be not a coward and a breaker of your knightly word. The themes of the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight are chivalry and the importance of truth. Sir Gawain showed chivalry by not flirting with the lady of the castle and trying his best to laugh it off. Sir Gawain also went back to meet with the Green Knight even though he was scared. Sir Gawain was truthful by giving a kiss to the lord of the castle who ends up being the Green Knight. But Sir Gawain was not truthful by keeping the lace to himself instead of giving it to the knight. What do you think are the uh, the themes of this story. We'll sit back, re relax, and decide for yourself. Am I lost? Farewell, my friend. I might not live to see another light. I guess I have found the chapel. Long have I waited for your arrival. Are you prepared? Do as you must and strike once and only once. I will only strike once, prepare for the blow. You are certainly not going the brave, you flinch at a sound. I have flinched once, you will not get the satisfaction of seeing me flinch again. So be prepared for the strike. All right, you had your one chance. If you strike again, we will fight. I will not strike again. I have done to you as you have done to me. I am loyal to the Lady of the Lake. The Lady has sent me to test all the knights in the land to see who was the bravest. I was the Lord of the Castle. Yes, it is I, Lord Burlak. You kept your promise the first two days, and that is why you were spared the first two strokes. But on the third day, you kept the green lace my Lady had given you, but you did it in fear of your life. If you had truly dishonored me, your head would be lying at my feet. I am so sorry, Green Knight. I feel so ashamed. I should have given you the handkerchief, but I was too afraid as to what might happen when I got here. I do not deserve to live. Cut off my head, Green Knight. No, no, it is no use to kill you, for you are the bravest knight in all of the land. Go home to your friends and family and enjoy a feast. You have done good today. Thank you, Green Knight. I will remember you forever. 
Goodbye, my friend.